that your baby boy would one day walk on water. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? And the child that you deliver will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm a storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod when you kissed your little baby you kissed the face of God Mary did you know Lord of all creation, Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect land and the sleeping child who holds him is the Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning and open them to the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah. They tell us if Isaiah was the only book we'd have, we'd have the entire Bible in our hand. Sixty-six chapters for sixty-six books. The prophet Isaiah is going to record a wonderful thing in the Word of God for us. This morning we're going to be looking at the prophecy of our Savior. The prophecy of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only are we going to look at his prophecy of the Savior, but Isaiah tells us not only does he prophesy that, but he also tells us who Jesus really is. He was more than just a babe in the manger. He was more than just the Messiah that was promised to Israel. He is more than just the Savior that was promised to the world that would take away the sins of the world. Isaiah records the fact that he was none other than God himself. We're going to look at the prophecy this morning as Isaiah gives it to us. And it's interesting, I wonder why so many people struggle with not wanting to believe that Jesus is the Savior. They don't want to believe he's the Messiah. They don't want to believe he's the Christ. Uh, they struggle with believing that he's God incarnate in the flesh. That's the big one they struggle with. Many of them today think he was nothing more than a teacher or perhaps a preacher or some rabbi. And some only think he was just a good man, went about doing good. And the Bible said he did do that. Many think that uh, he was just a myth, a legend, a story. Made up, I mean, you've you got to understand all this. And many struggle with the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior. 
But yet when we look at the Bible and what it teaches to us, we find some wonderful and interesting things. Matter of fact, the words and the works of the Old Testament prophets give us glimmers of a coming Savior, a king who would rescue his people and restore them to God. In fact, the Hebrew Scriptures contain more than 300 specific promises about the coming Savior or the Messiah as they called Him. The odds against them all happening by chance are astronomical. Yet these events actually happened just as predicted to the minutest detail. Matter of fact, Malachi predicted Jesus' birth in Bethlehem 700 years before it happened. 700 years. Daniel gave timetable for Jesus' appearance. Isaiah said the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Jeremiah foretold a time when, uh, when and because of Christ's birth, many children would be slaughtered. Hosea revealed that Mary and Joseph would have to go to Egypt to save Jesus' life. All of these prophecies were given some 500 to 700 years before Christ's birth. Isn't that wonderful? Not only a historical fact, but a fulfillment of prophecy, proving that He is the Messiah, the Savior of mankind. Also, when we take a look at the prophecy of the Savior here, we find that over 129 prophecies in the Old Testament alone, prophesied his birth. 129 and a little bit after his birth. The day that Jesus was born, that evening, that night, whatever, there in Bethlehem, in, in that stable, 109 of those prophecies came true and were fulfilled. That very night. 44 prophecies we find of concerning him as the Messiah that would be birthed as the Messiah. We find even in the book of Isaiah here some 42 prophecies just in Isaiah alone concerning the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like facts and figures like this. This interests me. And it gives a proving fact to those that are watching, that are wondering. All in all, there were over 300 prophecies concerning the birth of Christ and His first coming. And many fulfilled when Jesus was born that night. Then what's even, even more interesting than that, we find when we come to the second coming of Christ, there were 329 prophecies prophesying Jesus' coming back to this planet. 329. 129 in the Old Testament, 200 in the New Testament of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if all of the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled and came to pass and true down to the minutest detail in the Old Testament, then we can trust the remaining prophecies for Jesus is coming again. So we're going to take a look, though, this morning at Jesus' prophecy as the Savior as we take a look at it, I draw your attention to Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6 and 7. Two verses for our text, and then we're going to come back and take this verse apart, these verses apart, and look at them this morning. Isaiah says, For unto us a child is born. By the way, that speaks of his humanity. You might want to write that down in there. Unto us a son is given. That speaks of his deity. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, his peace shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. Now, how do we know we have all of that assured of? The next phrase, look at it. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. May we pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture and this text that we've read in your word of the promise of the, uh, the prophecy of our Savior coming. 
And Lord, we give you praise and glory for it. Thank you for its insight. Thank you for what we're going to learn today. And Father, we pray that those who go from this place will be no doubt in their mind that Jesus truly is the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the King of glory. He's God Almighty himself. And Father, we thank you and praise you for it. Use this message around the world, Father, to help those that struggle with the fact that they don't even believe in a Savior. They don't believe that Jesus is the Savior. Use your word today to penetrate into hearts and minds and let it be sharper than a two-edged sword. And may it accomplish your purpose and your will as you send it forth and send it out. And we will be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. And Father, most of all, as it goes forth around the globe in these weeks ahead, uh, and it goes out and accomplishes your will and purpose, we pray and trust that a multitude of people will be saved and born again. And we'll give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In this passage, we see a, a beautiful, wonderful coming of Christ. But we also see who Jesus really is. Let's look at verse number 6 now for again, and then we'll start off here. For unto us a child is born. And now this was prophesied seven, some 700 years before. In other words, the first thing I want you to see is God's provision. His provision. God has pro provided a Savior for us. Here's the provision of it, and we have the promise of a child. What was God's provision for us? He said, for unto us a child is born. That's God's provision. God has provided the world a Savior. God provided a world a Savior, and He promised a child some 700 years before it actually happened and came to pass and came true. Matter of fact, I want you to look at it here. Notice with me in John chapter 1 and verse 14. And the Word, talk to me, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That speaks of Christ's deity. Let's see, God promised us a child, but not only was he a promised child, ladies and gentlemen, Isaiah tells us who he really was. He is God incarnate in the flesh. And the word Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. That you shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. You see, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's what a Savior is. That's what a Savior does. He saves us from our sins. And we have the coming of the Savior prophesied by Isaiah some 700 years before it happened that God gave us provision of a Savior. And it would come through a promised child. And by the way, that child would be none other than himself. Amen. We need to get a hold of that fact. Listen to what the, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now see, Paul gets it all in right there just in that phrase. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Paul said that we were promised a Savior. Paul said His name is Jesus Christ our Lord. And it would come through the seed of David through the flesh of, of a woman by the name of Mary. Have you ever notice when you read the gospel story, especially like in Luke, and, it'll say, and it says, And Joseph and the mother of Mary. Did you catch that? And Joseph, the mother of Mary. Notice it doesn't say, and the father, Joseph, and the mother of Mary, because God didn't have a human father. Joseph had nothing to do with it, ladies and gentlemen. He was virgin born by none other than the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost. That's why it says Joseph and the mother of Jesus. And so we find here that he's the promised child that God provides for us. Notice what else? We find a perfect Savior. A perfect Savior. For unto us a child is born. That's his humanity. It was a promised child. For unto us a son is given. 
that speaks of His divine nature. That speaks of His deity, that He is the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Isaiah just doesn't prophesy we're getting a Savior and we're getting a child. We're getting the Lord Jesus Christ. We're getting God incarnate in the flesh. Because you see, that's who Jesus really is, ladies and gentlemen. He is God Almighty. You need to understand that this morning and get a hold of this truth. We have a perfect Savior. Listen to what 1 Timothy 3.16 says. And without controversy, notice, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, what is the mystery of godliness? Here it is. He tells us. Great is the mystery of godliness. Here's the mystery. Are you ready? God was manifest in the flesh. Who was that child that was prophesied and promised? It was none other than God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on the world, and received up in the glory. Hallelujah. You see, that's who we're looking at today. That's who Isaiah was prophesying that was coming. Not just a babe laying in a manger. Not just a babe in a cradle. Not just a babe there in a, in, in a stall, cattle stall in Bethlehem. No, that was none other than God Himself who laid aside the portals of glory and stepped out of glory and stepped into humanity and came and clothed Himself in humanity and dwelt among us and there He was. Oh, thank God for His provision. You see, you need a Savior today. When I was growing up and in the construction trade, in, in the electrical trade and construction, and uh, used to try to be a witness and talk to, I had a gentleman, he was a Jewish man, and I was always, he was uh, my journeyman, I was his apprentice, and uh, he was always trying to witness and to, to win him to Christ, and I'd keep telling him, you know, Jesus saves, and he'd look at me and say, saves what, green stamps? How many of y'all remember S&H green stamps? Okay, all right. And I'd catch him a little later, and, I, and I'd say to him, remember, Jesus saves. He says, you mean uh, top value, the yellow stamps, A and P, and all that stuff? And, and he'd like to joke and have fun with me, and, and, and so forth. And, and I just kept telling him, you know, Jesus wants to save you. He says, what do I need to be saved from, young man? Tell me. Why do you keep telling me I need to be saved? I said, well, let me put it to you this way. You need a Savior. Well, what do I need a Savior for? To save you. To save me from what? To save you from your sins. Because it's your sins that have separated you from God, both present and will be for all eternity, if you don't let Jesus save you, if you don't let the Savior save you from your sins, then you will die lost in your sins and spend an eternity in hell without Him. That's why I keep trying to tell you, you need to get saved. Not from green stamps, not from yellow stamps or top bags. No, you need to get saved from your sin so that you can go to heaven. That's why God said we needed a Savior. Because we've all sinned. And come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants. There's none that doeth good. There's none that seeketh after God. That's all in Romans chapter 3 if you want to go home and read it a little bit later on. And start out there in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, and 13. That's why we need it. So that's why God in His infinite wisdom told the prophet Isaiah some 700 years before Jesus would ever even be born. He said, you tell my people, you tell, put it in my book that I'm going to promise them a child who will be the savior of the world and, and, and he's going to be a perfect savior by the way and by the way Isaiah it's not just going to be a baby savior it's going to be me whoa wow awesome the prophecy of a savior listen to what John 1 1 says in the beginning was the what Word, Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word became flesh. Now, we have some that were knocking on my door yesterday, because I don't want to waste my time with that group. You understand that? Because their Bible says, and the Word was a God. You need to get that clear and get that straight right now in your thinking. Because to say that, that he was a God, then that would imply there's a whole lot more. 
And so which one do we have and which one's right and who's who? And we already got a lot of them out there that claim to be God. They're false gods. They're not real gods. They're not the genuine God. They're not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're not the God of this Bible that Isaiah is talking about. They're not the God that was this child that was born and prophesied who was the perfect Savior. Oh, praise God. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. Ah, the first man is of the earth. Now, who was that? He was earthly, wasn't he? Look how the Bible says that. He was earthly. But the second man is who? Now, watch this. He's the second man is the Lord. Okay, that's Adonai, Elohim, who happens to be God. Okay, and where's he from? Heaven. He's from heaven. See, Jesus came from heaven. Oh, he may have born, been born in a stable, my friend, but he was already preexisted in glory. Oh, praise God. That's why, listen to what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said. I like this. He who never began to be, but eternally existed, began to be what he eternally was not, and continued to be what he eternally was. Oh, thank you, Brother Spurgeon, for that insight. Philippians 2, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now let's move on in the verse. For unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. And we're going to drop down a little bit to the latter part of the verse, and then we'll come back to the other part there of it. But I want you to see, secondly, I want you to see now his person is described. His person is described. Look what Isaiah says. Here it is. Here he goes. He begins to describe this person, this person promised child, this perfect Savior, and his name shall be called, and now he says what? Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah now by his names begins to describe who this promised uh, pr provision of this Savior that was, God was providing, now he begins to describe who he really is. He was not just a child that was born unto us, okay? He was not just a son that was given to us, even though he was. He says, now let me describe to you who he really is. This is beautiful. 1 John 5, 20 says this, looking at your notes there. And now talk to me a little bit. And we say it says, and we know. All right, two of you do. Let's do it again. And we know. Now say this, and I know. Okay, what do you know? That the Son of God is come. What do you know this morning? How many of you believe that? See, there's a lot of people that don't believe that. There's a lot of people that don't believe that the Son of God has come. They don't believe that the Savior has come. And we need to tell them so. See, either you believe it or you don't. Either you're sure or you're not. You've either got this thing settled or you don't. What do I know this morning? Preacher, what do you know? I know that the Son of God has come. What do I base it on? On the authority of this book. Amen. The authority of the scriptures. And from there I would take it on the authority of the fact that he changed my life. But I know. What is it that you know this morning? That the Son of God has come. Do you know that? What else do you know? What has he done? He has given you understanding. Now what understanding has he given you this morning? That... We may know, or that you may know, or that I may know. Know who? Him that is true. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me except by the Father. That's why Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth shall make you free. And if you have the truth, you shall be free indeed. But you'll never know the truth if you don't know He is the truth. And look at this. And here's the fact. Now here's the truth. How many of you are sure you know God has come? How many of you know he's given you understanding this morning? What has he given you understanding about? That Christ is true, right? And that we are in him that is true. Can somebody say amen? So you're in Christ this morning who's true. Now who is that? Here it is. He tells us even his son, Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Don't miss the next phrase. Uh, you see what it says? This is the True what? Talk to me. This is the true God and eternal life. Verse John 5, 20 makes it very definite who we're talking about. So now let's have some 
a good time with this. Let's go down through these names for just a moment. First of all, the Bible describes this wonderful person that he is wonderful. How many of you can say he's wonderful this morning? How many of you believe he's wonderful this morning? He's wonderful because of the fact that he bore your sins on the cross. And he took your pain and your suffering that day on Calvary. That's why he's wonderful this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Exodus 15, 11 says, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Job put it this way in Job 9.10, Which doeth great things past, finding out, yea, and wonders without numbers. You see, the Bible says his name is wonderful. And I think the reason why he's wonderful is because he took my sins and nailed them to a cross. And he forgave them because he's my Savior. How many of you are familiar with the song, He's Wonderful? There's a wonder of sunset at evening. There's the wonder of sunrise I see, but the wonders of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God loves me, you see. There's the wonder of springtime and the harvest. There's the sky, the stars, the sun. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that's only begun. You know why his name is wonderful? My friend, because of this, oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder of it all, just to think that God saved me. That's the wonder. That's why his name is wonderful. We'll come back to that one in just a minute in another song that I like. Oh, praise God. Notice, he's the counselor. He's the counselor. He's the counselor of the Word of God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you won't find a better counselor. We got people today, and I'm not against psychiatrists. I'm not against psychologists and and doctors. And certainly we need those things and grateful for them and thank God for them and all the good work that they do for us. But I want to tell you the greatest counselor of all is none other than God himself. The Bible said he is the counselor. And here's where we get our counsel is from the Word of God. The Bible said that there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. Now, when you go to seek the multitude of counsel, you'd better seek the right counsel. See, a lot of people want to seek a lot of counsel, but they don't seek the right counsel and they get wrong counsel. You need to get to counsel from the Word of God because why? This little babe that was born, this child that was provided for us, the provision that God made of this promised Savior, this perfect child, this perfect Savior, He is the counselor of all counselors. And it is the Word of God Almighty. Listen to what Isaiah forty thirteen says. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being His counselor hath taught Him? Proverbs 19, 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. I tell you, he's the counselor. See, Isaiah said, listen, God made a provision and promised us a child 700 years before it would happen. He promised us a perfect Savior. But let me tell you who he really is. He says his name is wonderful. His name is Counselor. His name is the mighty God. Look at the next one, thirdly. The mighty God. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Who? In who? In Christ. Colossians 1, 2, 9. Colossians 1, 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him should all the fullness dwell. And now here's my favorite one. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. How many are you looking for the blessed hope? You know why you're looking for the blessed hope? Because God made a provision. Because God had promised a child would be born unto us. God promised us a perfect child, a perfect Savior. God promised that His name would be wonderful. God promised His name would be the counselor. God promised that His name would be the mighty God. That's why He's wonderful. Are you with me in all this this morning? Say amen. I know you've heard it, but I hope we see something new and learn something new. Looking for that blessed hope. Are you looking for that blessed hope this morning? That glorious appearing of the... Now watch this. Look what Paul says. Look what Paul calls him. Who are we looking forward to coming back in glory? Jesus. We're looking for the coming of the Lord. We're looking for the return of Christ. Are we not? Are we looking for that great and glorious appearing? Now watch this. Look what Paul says. Look what Paul says. Look at this. That appearing of our what? Talk to me. Our great 
God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isaiah prophesied that we would have a Savior, and it was none other than God himself. Oh, praise God. He's the mighty God. That takes me back to this song I like in our hymn on page, page 101. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Who? Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty king, the master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd. He's the rock of all ages. Almighty God is he. You see, bow down before him. Love and adore him. Why? His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord, for what God has given to us. Let's look at the next one. He said, not only is his name mighty God, but he's also called the everlasting father. First John 5, 20, we already read that and you saw that. And we know that the son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him. That is true. And we are in him. That is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Now look at the writer of Hebrews. I like this passage of scripture. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God who at sundry times in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Are you with me now? Follow along with me in this. Hath, when, and when? In these last days, spoken unto us by dreams. Has spoken unto us by visions. Has spoken unto us by new revelation. See, that's what's going on today. But the Bible says, He has spoken to unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir over all things, by whom also He made the worlds. Now wait a minute. You see, if Jesus only began to exist in Bethlehem, then there's something wrong with His verse. Because the verse said He made all the worlds. So that means He had to be before that, didn't He? Oh, this is good. Don't miss this stuff. Who, being in the brightness of his glory and expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. See, now he comes back to the fact of the Savior. But in that verse, the writer of Hebrew tells us he was before time. He was before even the worlds were created. Now he tells us he purged our sins. How did he? Because he was the perfect child of God. He was the perfect Savior. He was the perfect child that was promised to us 700 years before it happened. Oh, I love the Bible, how good it makes us together, runs together so beautifully here. And he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Then notice the Bible says he is the Prince of Peace. Here's a fifth name that's given to him as Isaiah begins to describe this person who Jesus really is. The Prince of Peace, Luke 2, 14. Luke 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill to men. How would you like to have been that day and heard the angels singing that to the shepherds? Huh? Why? He's the Prince of Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, there will be no peace. Until the Prince of Peace comes. We can send all the ambassadors we want. We can send all of our secretaries of states we want. To go over here and arrange and try to negotiate some kind of peace treaties and peace signings. And it's never going to happen. It will not happen until the Prince of Peace comes in the clouds of glory. And establishes and sets up his millennial kingdom and his reign. Then there will be perfect peace. But until then, there will be no peace. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Paul put it this way in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and your soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There again, Paul puts the two together as the same person. Oh, thank God for Do you have peace today? See, you're never going to have peace until you know the Prince of Peace. You're never going to have peace in your heart. You're never going to have peace in your home. You're never going to have peace in your marriage. You're never going to have peace in your relationship until you embrace the Prince of Peace. 
Do you invite the Prince of Peace to come into your heart and life and let him bring peace and joy and happiness in your life and in your home and in your family? If not, it's going to be a constant war and constant battle. You know how you have a victory when there's a war? Somebody has to surrender. See, if you want victory, you have to surrender. See, if you want victory in your life this morning, you want peace in your life, you're at war right now. There's a battle going on with the flesh. There's a battle going on with your spirit and your nature. And there's a constant war. Maybe you're to the place where you say, I've had enough. I don't want any more war. I don't want any more fighting, preacher. I want peace. Then may I say surrender. Wave the white flag of surrender. I surrender all. And when you surrender, there's victory. There's peace that passes all understanding. Peace unspeakable and full of glory. And now the peace of God can rule and reign in your heart. But not until, you see. And it wouldn't be made possible had there not been a Savior prophesied now 20, over 2,700 years ago. Oh, thank God. He's the Prince of Peace. And then lastly this morning, let's go back to the middle part of that verse 6 and let's take a look at it. We've looked at his provision was prophesied. We've looked at his person was described. Now I want you to see his power unveiled. His power unveiled. Notice what the Bible says. It's a power that will bring eternal peace. It's a power that will bring eternal peace. Notice, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That word government in the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word there means the authority to rule. The right to be the sovereign of all the earth. Jesus Christ has the right to be the sovereign of all the earth. He has the right to have the supreme sovereign authority and rule over this universe. Because why? He's God. Oh, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That word phrase upon his shoulder means the responsibility of rule and judgment and justice is upon him. So we see, A, that he has the power to bring eternal peace. Israel's looking for that peace. And they're going to have a temporary one coming up soon. They're going to sign a peace covenant treaty with the Antichrist. Daniel 9, 27. And they're going to think peace is everything's fine. Then the Bible says, and all of a sudden, suddenly shall come upon them as woman in travail. And that peace treaty will be broken by the Antichrist. And there will be no peace for the next three and a half years of that tribulation period known as the Great Tribulation, the second half. Until the Prince of Peace comes in the clouds of glory. Oh, He is the Prince of Peace. Why? He's the, he, he brings eternal peace. Be there in your study notes. Notice, He not only has the power to bring eternal peace, He has the power to bring eternal order. Notice what the verse says there now in verse 7. Verse 7 says, Of the increase of His government, and what, church? Peace. There shall be no end. Upon the throne of David... And upon his kingdom, now here it is, he has the power to order it and to establish it. He has not only the power to order it, that is, he has the authority and he has the ability. Who does? Jesus Christ. This one who was prophesied. That's why Revelation 19, 6 says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Oh, you see, His power unveiled. He is the one that will bring eternal peace. He is the one that will bring order. He is the one that will bring ability and authority to this planet when He comes back in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Isaiah was giving us the whole picture there. 
in those two verses. We had, the, we had the prophecy of his first coming. We had the prophecy of his second coming. Did you see it? Did you miss it? He described who he was, the person who he really is. He described his provision. He described uh, uh, his person. He described his power is unveiled. Oh, thanks be to God. Now let me draw your attention to some verses here in the Old Testament. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Follow along as we read together in these verses. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep without... This is God speaking here in Samuel to David, King David. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. That's Christ's kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long, church? Forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And if he commit iniquity, speaking of David now, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him. God's mercy will not depart away from David. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee, and thine house and thine kingdom, this is David's kingdom, shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ and his throne. Luke 1, 52 and 55. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath hopeless his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And I close with this this morning. The immense step from the babe at Bethlehem to the living, reigning, triumphant Lord Jesus. Returning to the earth for His own people. That is a glorious truth proclaimed throughout Scripture. Now as the bells ring out the joys of Christmas this season, may we also be alert for the final trumpet that will announce His return when we shall always be with Him ask you a question this morning will you be with him when he comes in the clouds of glory will you be with him when the final trumpet sounds do you know him whom to know is life everlasting whom to know is truth have you embraced that truth and received that truth do you have the assurance that one day you will be with him in glory I ask you that, this audience this morning, I ask those of you that are watching by television, listening on the radio and on the internet this morning, do you know Him? Do you know that you will be with Him? Are you absolutely, 100% sure that you will be with Him and you know that? And if you do, how do you, what do you base that on? Do you base that on the fact because you've joined a church? You filled a card, signed a card, said a prayer, walked an aisle, went through a class, became a part of a denomination or some other faith or religion, and you've gone through all of that. Is that your assurance this morning of heaven? Or could you say, no, it's because I know Him. It's because there was one day a time in my life when I repented of my sin, and I trust and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust and believed on that promised child that day, the one, the babe in the manger, who would be the Savior of the world that would save me from my sins. And I have asked Him to forgive me and to cleanse me. And I've asked Him to come into my heart, into my life, and to receive Him as my Lord and Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die or to go to be with Him when He comes in the clouds of glory. Do you know Him today? Have you been saved? And do you know it? That's what this is all about. That's what it's all about. Is people being saved and coming to Christ and knowing it for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt. If you've never trusted Christ, quit trusting in everything and anything else. Religion, faith, denomination. No, no. Put your faith in trust in the babe in the manger that night because he wasn't just the babe in the manger. He was the king of glory. He was God incarnate in the flesh who dwelt among us. 
and he will save his people from their sins. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what you need to be saved from because it's your sin that will separate you from God now and for all eternity. For the wages of your sin and my sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through who? Jesus Christ my Lord. Do you know him today? If you were to die today in this auditorium right now, do you know for sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that heaven would be your home? If not, I would not delay it. I would not put it off. I would not hesitate. I wouldn't even wait till we start singing. I'd get out of my seat and I'd run down here to this aisle and these benches and I would simply say, God, forgive me. Lord, forgive me and cleanse me. Come into my heart and life and be my Lord and my Savior. I would say, Lord, be God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me. Oh, my friend, if you've not done that, why not do that today? And those of you that are watching by television, internet, YouTube, iPhones, iPads, around the globe, why not come to Christ today? I'll ask you one more time. Do you know Him? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Friends, you can know Him today. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life and that they lead by believing on His name. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to give everyone in this auditorium an opportunity to come to Christ and to know Him. But we're going to give those that are watching by television first an opportunity because of our time is running out. Today, if you'd like to know Him, if you'd like to trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, would you pray with us? Now, it's not the prayer that saves you. Those are words communicating with God. What saves you is putting your faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ, of that babe, that Savior that was born in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago, who happens to be the eternal God. Would you be willing to do that today? If you would, would you pray with me? Those of you that are in the auditorium, perhaps you'll pray right along with us as well. Pray with us, dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth you are the Lord. And I confess that I'm a sinner. And I know I've sinned against you, God. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Oh, he took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe that you were buried and that you rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior. And I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. We'll trust that many of you came to Christ today. Put your faith and trust in Him. Church, let's stand to our feet. We'll sing our hymn of invitation, Just As I Am, because that's the way you got to come. Remember, there's the prophecy of the Savior, but He was more than just a Savior. He was the eternal God. Now let me ask you something. If you were God, and you did all what you did, creation and all of that, and then created us, and then we went around and sinning and wicked and wicked and evilness, let me ask you something. Would you leave the portals of glory and come and die on a cross for this sin-sick, wicked world if you were God? That's something to think about. But that's what he did for us. I'll lay aside my glory here for a short time in the portals of glory. And I will step out into eternity. And I will go down and be conceived of a virgin Mary. And I will take on humanity and become flesh. And I will dwell amongst them and with them. I will walk with them and eat with them. I'll go fishing with them. I'll cry with them. I'll hurt with them. And I'll suffer with them. 
And then there'll come a time I'll lay down my life for them because I love them and because they need a Savior. Oh, friend, don't pass it up if you've never trusted Christ. Why not come to Him today and trust Him as your Lord and Savior and be saved and be born again? You couldn't receive a better gift this Christmas season than to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the prophesied Messiah. He's the prophesied Savior. He's the promised child. He's the perfect Savior. He's none other than God Himself. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you.